Last week, in response to an accident in which a Tesla crashed in Texas, apparently with nobody at the wheel killing its remaining occupants, engineers at Consumer Reports showcased how it was possible to trick a Tesla to operate in autopilot with nobody in the driver's seat. This story was repeated fairly extensively in both automotive and mainstream press, reported in a variety of different ways. Some were blatantly salacious with little factual reporting. Others were more dutiful to accepted journalistic standards, reiterating key points from the original Consumer Reports article and explaining the differences between facts and hearsay. Whichever version folks happened to consume, however, the battle lines were drawn, and the electric car internet kind of blew up. Consumer Reports has been accused of intentionally trash-talking or misrepresenting the facts surrounding the original collision. It's been accused of being a mouthpiece of legacy automakers like Ford, allegedly eager to kill electric vehicles. Then there have been a seemingly endless stream of opinions and opinion pieces on the matter. Many Tesla fans and owners have gone to great lengths to try and debunk consumer reports as lying. But to date, I've seen very little trying to ask what's really going on here and what our focus really should be on. So we're going to try and do that now. Side note. I want to acknowledge here that as with anything Tesla related these days, I and the team have sat on this story to try and let the metaphorical dust settle, both because we think it helps provide some extra clarity and sadly, because I know whatever we will say in this piece, someone somewhere will get upset. Someone in the comments to this piece will accuse us, as usual, of being anti-Tesla, despite someone on our team owning one that they are quite fond of. Someone else will accuse us of being too soft on Tesla, and there will be every myriad of argument in between. With that in mind, know that we've gone over this with a fine-toothed comb. We've gone over the facts, and I hope that what we're left with are things that you need to know. And yes, this is going to be a long video. Before all of that, on behalf of our entire team here, I want to express our deepest sympathies to the families of the two people who died in the apparent nobody-at-the-wheel accident in Texas. Regardless of how the accident occurred or who is ultimately at fault, losing a loved one is never easy at any time. Losing a loved one in a horrific accident, and I speak from personal experience, changes your life forever. When discussing any fatality, we should never lose sight of the humanity and the lives affected by it. With that, let's look at this Texas accident. Just under two weeks ago at the time of publishing this video, a 2019 Tesla Model S struck a tree in the private gated community of the Woodlands, an area to the north of Houston, Texas. According to local police reports, the car was traveling at speed when it missed a corner, struck a tree, and burst into flames. Both occupants of the car, at least the occupants that first responders encountered upon arriving at the scene, died. Official police statements from Harris County Precinct 4 Constable Mark Herman state that those two occupants were situated in the front passenger seat and the rear passenger seat. They also confirm that when first responders arrived on scene, nobody was in the driver's seat. Regarding both deceased occupants, the same police officer told Reuters that, quote, We have witness statements from people that said they left to test drive the vehicle without a driver and to show the friend how it can drive itself, end quote. The owner of the vehicle was later identified as the deceased rear seat passenger, and Reuters reported that Constable Herman also stated witness statements have been collected, indicating that there was nobody in the driver's seat of the Model S at the time of the accident. As is usually the case with news stories involving Teslas, because of Tesla's high profile and ongoing development of both autopilot and full self-driving features, it didn't take long for the story to become quickly confused. Because witnesses stated there was nobody at the wheel prior to the collision and nobody was found in the driver's seat, the suspicion quickly moved to Tesla's autopilot system. But because of confusion in the general media and among the general public surrounding Tesla autopilot and Tesla full self-driving, which are different things, things got muddy pretty quickly. Reports claiming that the fire took four hours to extinguish which spread pretty widely, were quickly corrected by Palmer Buck, fire chief for the Woodlands Township Fire Department. 
He told the Houston Chronicle that the fire was brought under control after two or three minutes on the scene, noting that after the inferno was extinguished, members of his team carried out what's known as final extinguishment for several hours. That term is used by firefighters for the procedures carried out after a fire has been contained to ensure that the fire cannot reignite, usually continued monitoring and dosing of water. Because there were deceased on board the vehicle and because of the need to preserve evidence, that process took a lot longer than it might have done without bodies in the vehicle. Fire Chief Buck also dismissed inaccurate reports that the department had rang Tesla for assistance with the fire. He stated, quote, We did not call Tesla and I do not know where that rumor came from. There is a chance somebody else did, maybe the Harris County Fire Marshal, but we did not call Tesla. Tesla has an emergency manual for first responders, end quote. In the time immediately following the accident, Mesny Tesla fans took to the internet to argue that Tesla's autopilot system couldn't be to blame here, stating that Tesla's autopilot disengages if it doesn't detect anybody holding the wheel. A few days after the accident, Elon Musk took to Twitter to state, quote, data logs recovered so far show autopilot was not enabled and this car did not purchase full self-driving. Moreover, standard autopilot would require lane lines to turn on, which this street did not have, end quote. In response, the Harris County Precinct 4 said that it would, quote, eagerly wait for the data, end quote, that Musk said Tesla had recovered from the vehicle. By the end of the week, both the National Traffic Safety Board and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration were engaged in investigations, with cooperation from the local police and Tesla into the fatalities. I know that Tesla, or rather Elon Musk acting as a proxy for the company, has stated initial logs report autopilot was not engaged and that the car did not have full self-driving purchased for it. But I should also remind you that this is an ongoing investigation, which means that for now, at least, we shouldn't be coming to hard and fast conclusions. That said, I will give you some other things to be cognizant of later in this video. During its Q1 earnings call, various Tesla staff stated that auto steer did not and could not engage on the road conditions present at the time of the accident, as it was designed to, and that adaptive cruise control only engaged when the driver was buckled into the seat and driving above 5 miles per hour, again as intended. The car accelerated to about 30 miles per hour between then and the time the car crashed. The car's adaptive cruise control deactivated when the driver's seatbelt was unbuckled and the vehicle did slow down. Evidence from the accident scene shows all seatbelts were unbuckled after the accident, while the steering wheel was, quote, indeed deformed, leading to the likelihood that someone was indeed in the driver's seat and all seatbelts post-crash were unbuckled, end quote. Sadly, though, the car's SD card, which would have more data from the accident or video of the crash, was not retrieved. It's not clear why, but after such an intense fire, I believe it may have been destroyed. This changes things, but I think we also should be careful to not jump to conclusions one way or the other. We should leave final determinations to those professionals investigating the crash. Before we get to the Consumer Reports debacle, let's just make sure that we're clear on what autopilot and what full self-driving is, because it's important you understand the difference. Autopilot is Tesla's advanced semi-autonomous driver assistance feature. It combines a mass of different technologies and sensors to keep your car safely planted in the lane, following an appropriate distance from the car in front. It identifies lane markings and uses them to figure out where the car is, as well as cloud intelligence to identify and deal with obstacles and construction zones. It can speed up and slow down with traffic. It operates somewhere around level two, maybe level three on the SAE autonomous vehicle scale. Tesla's full self-driving meanwhile, which is currently available to some customers in beta form, is far more advanced. It is closer to a high level three or low level four on the SAE autonomous vehicle scale, and it can tackle the majority of daily driving duties with minimal human interaction. While the driver is required to keep their hands on the wheel, the car does all of the heavy work of driving. It can change lanes automatically, handle some intersections, and recognises stop sites, traffic lights, and other road features. The former, Autopilot, now comes standard with every new Tesla. 
The latter is a beta feature for now, but customers can opt to spec their cars to have it at time of purchase for US$10,000 or equivalent, with Tesla due to activate it at a later date via an over-the-air software update. Though full purchase of self-driving does unlock some new features now, such as auto lane change and summon. I've chatted to Winter on the team about his own personal experience with Autopilot. He owns a Tesla Model 3. And he has reiterated a couple of things I think are very important here. First, Autopilot is very obvious about when it is and isn't active and extremely vocal about when it disengages, especially when due to road conditions or lack of driver inputs. Tesla has improved this warning system greatly since its early days of Autopilot. In normal operation, Autopilot will turn itself off if it doesn't detect some level of steering wheel input and gets progressively more intrusive in its attempts to alert the driver if it thinks they aren't holding the wheel. First, a simple text message, then flashing lights, and then a very loud, audible alert. If it continues to detect this condition, the Autopilot system will turn itself off and sometimes remains deactivated until the car is power cycled. Which leaves us where? Well, in a position where the accident in Texas is still very many unanswered questions surrounding it. There are obvious discrepancies between police witness reports and what Elon Musk says the car didn't have. But of course, there are a couple of possibilities here outside of one or more people currently being wrong in their official statements on the matter, of course. Or there was actually a driver who fled the scene. The latter seems unlikely, though, because of those statements given to the police. The first possibility I can think of is that somehow the Model S in question either did have the feature active, and either Musk or Tesla is incorrect, or that it was indeed driving itself through some kind of third-party method, be it a software hack, a hardware modification, or something else. To be clear, I'm not stating that I believe this to be true, but rather that if all other explanations at the current time appear not to point to official autopilot or full self-driving, something else must have been going on. And we've seen Tesla's hacked and modified plenty of times in the past, so we shouldn't discount that out of hand. The other possibility is that somehow the car's safety checks were defeated, which does bring us to the Consumer Reports video, filmed on a closed track, and the whole truckload of controversy that it brought to the table. Using a weight on the steering wheel to mimic just enough force to convince the car someone was at the wheel, a Consumer Reports engineer buckled the seatbelt behind them as unbuckling the driver's seatbelt shuts off autopilot, activated autopilot, and brought the car to a complete stop by setting autopilot speed to zero using the right scroll wheel on their steering wheel. They then jumped over to the front passenger seat without opening the door, as that again would likewise deactivate autopilot, and then used the same right scroll wheel to set a higher speed for autopilot to operate at. The car dutifully obliged, unaware that someone was not in the driver's seat. The easily tricked statement from Consumer Reports about this is frankly as misleading a statement as autopilot is a misleading term for this car's system, as it involves multiple steps and frankly I hope no sane individual would reproduce those steps in the real world. And if they did, well they would deserve to have their license revoked and some serious penalties levied against them. As I've said time and time again, it's often not the technology at fault, but the people who abuse it, and the lack of sufficient checks and balances to prevent people from abusing it in the first place. Yet, in my experience, it's not just Tesla systems that can be tricked. I've driven Teslas with and without autopilot, but not experienced FSD as a vehicle driver. I've driven Nissan's ProPilot system, and I've experienced Hyundai Kia, General Motors and Ford's advanced lane keep assist and radar assisted cruise control systems. Every car's steering control could be tricked in some way or another, be it a knee on the wheel instead of a hand or something else, to believe that you are holding the wheel. Essentially, these systems rely on a torque sensor in the wheel to detect the small changes that the steering has when you're naturally holding the wheel. But all of these systems, as far as I remember, get upset if someone is not in the seat and they are not buckled in. And within anywhere from a few seconds to nearly a minute, they, just like Tesla's autopilot system, make a lot of noise and fuss if you're not using that system properly. Some cars go even further, using driver-facing cameras to detect driver attentiveness, and again, if they detect the driver is not paying attention, they cause a big fuss, meaning defeating them is pretty hard. And I should note here that those systems aren't always semi-autonomous, but they can instead simply be an additional safety feature. 
Which brings me to the true hands-off semi-autonomous features found in General Motors Super Cruise and Ford's Blue Cruise. In both instances, the technology that allows hands-off driving implements a driver-facing camera to detect there's a driver there and watching their eyes to make sure that they are paying attention to the road ahead. Unlike Tesla's autopilot and full self-driving, these systems are also currently limited to predetermined roads chosen by vehicle engineers at each company. Tesla's full self-driving system also has a driver-facing camera, which is being currently tested. But as Green the Only recently demonstrated on Twitter, we'll link to their Twitter account below, it too can be tricked into thinking the driver is alert and paying attention with just a picture held in front of the driver in the right place. I'm sure the same is true for other driver assistance systems, because unless I'm mistaken, I believe they all use the regular cameras, not the kind of LiDAR and infrared-based systems that Apple uses for its face unlock feature on iPhones, depending on the generation of iPhone you have. And that's important because the latter is much harder, although not impossible, to circumvent with a printed picture. But the reality is, sadly, regardless of if there was or wasn't someone behind the wheel of this particular vehicle in this particular crash, we humans are lazy mofos. We try and do take shortcuts at every opportunity. And even when safety measures exist to try and save ourselves, we will sometimes, bluntly, refuse to use them. I could, of course, wax lyrical about the parallels between proper use of semi-autonomous driver assistance systems and the use of seatbelts in cars. But instead, I will remind you that in the US, most cars that are sold elsewhere in the world have stronger, more powerful airbags than their counterparts in, say, Europe or Asia. And the reason isn't because of physical differences between Americans and people elsewhere in the world. But the sad fact that too many Americans, even today, refuse to wear seatbelts. Indeed, even today, there's one US state where seatbelts aren't required by law, and there are many more US states where you can't be pulled over for not wearing a seatbelt, but can be ticketed for not wearing a seatbelt if you're pulled over for some other unconnected reason. My point, we humans are our worst enemies, and while legislation surrounding how semi and fully autonomous driving systems should work is, I think, required to ensure a homogeneous approach to autonomous vehicle technology, you are never going to completely stop people from voluntarily taking risks that are both dangerous to them and to others. Which leaves us where car companies, including Tesla, do need to figure out how to better advertise and educate around their technologies. Or I think that other people will end up doing more stupid things with their vehicles. And I also think car companies should be forced to prove that their vehicles can carry out specific tasks safely before they're allowed to operate with semi and fully autonomous technology on the road. Call it the autonomous vehicle driving test equivalent to a Turing test. But we as a society also need to ask ourselves several questions. And here they are. How safe must autonomous vehicles be before we trust them? Are we okay with people crashing their cars because they misuse them? And to be clear, I'm not saying it was or wasn't misuse in this accident. We won't know until the investigation has been completed. But we also need to ask ourselves what legal implications all of this carries. Let me know your thoughts below. That's it for today. As always, thanks to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month Patreons, Anonymous Freak, Aragene Fellows, Gordon C., Paul Conway, Laura Sandborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Tesla in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. If you would like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, you will find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Ko-fi. You can chat with the team and TE fans over at Discord. And if you'd like to buy some TE swag, just head over to our Redbubble store. Don't forget to hit subscribe and the notification bell. Thanks for joining me. And as always, keep evolving. Keep evolving.